But that wouldn't work if like, had a cattle prod and just chased after all the kids. <laughs> that wouldn't have been good. Yeah, but if I had a camcorder, it'd be funny. <laughs> of course, I'm a twisted little bastard anyway. <laughs> But the only people of color were the security. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you today about the Olympia Zine Library and Archive. And I'm going to start out by telling you who I am, how I got involved with zines, and um, where I think I'm going with this whole project. And then I'm going to take questions for you, from you, and I'm going to try to leave you with some questions that I've run into with the zine library that I really don't have any answers for, but the more ideas I get from people, maybe eventually I'll get these things figured out. Um, my name's Courtney Bennett, and I used to do this zine called Teenage Horror Book which later became Bitchfield, and lots of mini zines on the side. And then I started doing Wishing for My Star last fall, which is like a newsprint zine. Um, I used to contribute to Outpunk that Matt Wobbensmith did. And um, I started the zine library two years ago in Olympia, and I'm a student at Evergreen there right now. Um, I got involved with zines because I'd always been involved with pen pals. Um, since like, I got chain letters in elementary school. I was always writing to 30 or 40 people. And somewhere along the line, my address crossed with people who were doing zines in the early 90s. And I got sent zines, even though I didn't know what they were. And I had heard about Riot Girl in Indie Rock, but like, I thought Indie Rock had something to do with Indian music. And like, <laughs> like, it just, like, I was clueless. But, People made me mixtapes, and they really helped me out a lot. And you know, I finally figured out like what all this stuff was, um, like what a seven-inch was. And um, <coughs> I was just absolutely addicted. I probably received like three zines, and I was like, I'm going to make my own zine. This is the awesomest thing I've ever seen. And I tried to do it with my friend Candace, and it just didn't work trying to do a zine with another person. She dropped out before that issue even came out. But in 1994, I did a zine a month for 12 months when I was in high school. Um, and those were all the first issues of Teenage Horror Book. Um, I graduated high school a year early because I lived near Philadelphia in the suburbs and it just sucked beyond all human belief, except for Philadelphia. Um, but without a car, it was not fun to live in the suburbs. And I moved to Olympia, Washington. I had a hippie friend that told me about it, and it just seemed like there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in Olympia and at Evergreen. And I really wanted to be a part of that, and that's just where I thought that I fit in. And I went there, and my first year was really tough. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends. Um, and then things started to get better, and I just kept doing my zines because that's really all I had to ground me when I was living in the dorms all alone. And that summer after I moved there, I had been talking with people about zine libraries, and I had seen the one in San Francisco at the Epicenter Zone. And I just thought, there, I knew that everyone had zines that were just sitting in their rooms, and they were in shoeboxes. I had five crates worth, because I would just buy zines and trade zines, and I had 300 pen pals. And I really just wanted to share them with the community and share them with other people. Um, and my friend Rue at the time was talking about also doing an archive for flyers and just kind of something to keep this history the way it really should be and not just like people writing about it in academic journals or writing about it in magazines like Spin or, or making books about it when they didn't know what they were talking about. So. I asked around and tried to find a place to put my zines where people could access them. And there was a place called the Liberation Cafe, which was an, it was a political collective. They weren't anarchists or socialists. It was basically left-wing politics who had a space above this coffee shop called Bulldog News. 
And Bulldog News sells magazines and newspapers from all over the world, so they're really committed to um, just having all kinds of publications available for people. So I got some shelving donated from Bulldog News downstairs and just put the zines out on the shelves and tried to recruit people to help me with cataloging the zines, like making a card catalog. And for the first time, it wasn't people who got in fights with me and left the project. People just moved out of Olympia and moved to Portland or New York or wherever they were going. So I ended up being the one person who stuck with it um, for the whole time. And then I gave up with the card catalog because it just wasn't happening to list like what each team talked about and try to cross-reference and it was impossible. And um, then the Liberation Cafe kind of got, they stopped putting on activities and they kind of got kicked out of Bulldog News more or less. They still have an office there, but they're not taking up the whole second floor. But the zine library is still there because the owner of Bulldog thinks that it's you know, a good community resource to have. And I just think it's really more important to keep the themes available for the public. And I try to do as many promotional things as I can, um, like writing up really formal press releases and sending them to magazines. And a lot of people have helped me out. Um, Cynthia Connolly at Discord sends out flyers with people's orders and had a friend write like a little thing in, in Maximum Rock and Roll that got me a lot of zines. And last week, Slim Moon from Kill Rock Stars said that he's going to give me all of the zines Kill Rock Stars ever received, which he promised me is a truckload. Um, Joe Preston from the Melvins also donated tons of Maximum Rock and Rolls from the 80s and old fact sheet fives and like really incredible zines that I would never be able to find in a store ever again. Um, so I've gotten a lot of community support from people who have been involved for a really long time who have zines that are unavailable, that they're making available again. And this summer, my friend Zoe Rothberg, who's a student at the University of Chicago, is going to write a, um, she's going to write a platform on, she has computer sciences, and we're going to try to scan zines onto CD-ROM to make like a copyable archive that I can give to other people. So if you can't have copies of all the zines, they'll be like, a CD copy for libraries for people who want to look at zines, um, you know, without doing all the photocopying and things. So that's what I'm hoping for in the future. And it would be my like dreamiest dream for the zine library to have its own cafe space with its own staff to make sure things don't get stolen and all that. But until that happens, I'm just trying to collect as much as possible and make them as accessible as they can for other people. That's about all. So. Yeah. so, if you guys have any questions, I'd like to answer those first, and then I can tell you some of the big questions that I've been running into that, um, you know, if you guys want to talk about or do my ideas or just things to think about. The first um, thing that comes to my mind is um, what have, like, especially with lots of those Maxim Rock and Rolls from the 80s that are completely threadbare and falling apart. Like, how much of it can be saved? Like, eventually, a lot of that stuff's just going to disintegrate with nothing. Yeah, so. that's a big thing, um, is, like, keeping them in readable order and also, like, um, like there's a high theft rate because there's no security there, really, unless somebody sees you taking it. So the thing that I hope for with the... Um, like security wise is just that if people take them, hopefully they'll donate them back to the Zine Library eventually. Um, and like with the maximum rock and rolls that are falling apart, it is kind of good. A lot of people save their maximum rock and rolls for whatever reason. And so we have multiple copies of a lot of the maximum rock and rolls. And that's one of the another reason why I'm trying to get um, the things like onto a hard copy on CD is so that if things do fall apart or get stolen, there'll still be a copy available somehow. Um, like I think one of the great things about zines is that like we don't sell the zines, and we really. On one hand, I can't say like you know, oh, go make a copy for yourself because I don't have the permission of the person who made the zine to say that. But if you make a copy of a zine, it's pretty much as good as having the original zine itself. So I hope that like if things are really falling apart, 
you know, that I can go and make another copy and put that copy, or keep that copy until the other one totally falls apart. Um, but it is like a big consideration that, you know, it's just like comic books or anything, the more you handle them, the more they're gonna fall apart, and that's why, you know, CD and like microfilm and microfiche happen. So I'm just trying to move more of the zines into that so they don't disappear. Scott? Is it a, is it a lending library? Uh, we don't have a staff there to make it a lending library, but there's no security to not make it a lending library. <laughs> so I get a lot of phone calls where people are like, oh, I'm borrowing these zines for a project. I'll bring them back. And you really do have to just trust the people. And it's a good thing, um, you know, just kind of like to trust the people in your scene that they're not going to take things and not return them. Um, there's a lot of things in Olympia that are, you know, like kind of run like that, like really low security. And you just trust that people aren't going to rip you off. Um, but I do, like if people want to take the things out, I always say like, you know, of course you can take them. I couldn't tell if you, they didn't ask me if you took them. Um, but eventually if we move into a cafe space, I would like to have um, like more of a record book of who took what zines? Someday. Has there been a lot of people interested that have come to, to read through the zines, to through the zines? For instance, we, we try to do, and people will occasionally try to revive this project, of having a zine archive and library where I'm from in Arkansas. And it's, it'll be a little interest at first, but then, of course, we don't have population. You probably do. Olympia is really yes. small. <laughs> it's so small. Um, basically, the like the heart of downtown Olympia is like four blocks, like like two square blocks, I suppose, and that's where like the theater is and the record store that everyone goes to and the coffee shop where the zine library is. Um, So when I'm, I'm there usually about five hours a week where I just sit there and like put things out on the shelf and try to reorganize things. And there are, um, like while I'm there, there are usually at least two or three people who will come up to look through the zines. But it's not, um, the whole town isn't very spread out. And I know that a lot of people who are traveling through just like to come up and see what's going on. And it's also a really quiet, part of a coffee shop to go to to study and read. Um, but as far as like interest um, volunteer wise, it's been really up and down. Um, like I said, I had the problem where people would volunteer for two months and then they move away. So I've been the core person for the whole time and it's really just been saying, you know, well even if people don't help me, I'm gonna continue paying the rent on the PO box and continue putting out these zines. Um, and any help I get is great, and if people can only volunteer once or twice, that's better than not having them come at all. But it would be it would be nice to have some kind of consistency. Um, Bulldog News donates the space because they feel that it brings um, people into you know to buy coffee and magazines downstairs. Um, the zines that are in the library are all donations. I. Um, I do a lot of zine trades because I have my own zine, and after I read and review my zines, I always put them in the library. We have, there's some minimal expenses for things like photocopying, um, like pamphlets, which I have some informational pamphlets over there about the zine library. And um, for that, we sell zines on consignment at Phantom City Records, which is a record store around the corner. And that brings in probably about $10 a month, which covers all of our photocopying costs, um, which is basically all we have right now. Um, and occasionally we'll need to buy like hardware and things to build shelves with. Um, but we've been just really lucky. We had a benefit when we first started out that was really awesome. I got like five bands to play in the space and they all played for free. And um, that kind of gave me like the $80 that I needed to start it up. But I've been really lucky that it's been really, um, it's been really self-sustaining with the donations and keeping the costs 
to a minimum. Um, it's basically how I've had to do it. Good. Uh, do you want to consent on that? Do you want to staple the word? Do you want to stop having to like? Um, definitely stapled is a lot better because if I get things that aren't stapled, we sit there and we staple them ourselves before we put them out. Um, when I when I distro zines in Stockton and Phantom City, I usually just pay the person up front for five copies of their zine because I don't like having to keep records of how much like I owe people and sending back copies and all that. I trust that I'll be able to sell five copies eventually. Um, so any donations that just come into my mailbox, you know, I usually I usually read them first and review them for my zine and then put them in the zine library. Um, you know, just try to get them as much exposure as possible and like help zine writers out who are really helping out the zine library like more than they could ever imagine by like sending me stuff. And it's nice because it's like I get free zines all the time. <laughs> I'm always having new zines to read. Um, that's like kind of like a perk on my side because that's what I really like to do. Um, have you ever um, thought of or feel specific aversion to um, hooking up with or being a part of a major library? Like at the Kansas City Art Institute here, it's very little known fact that there is a little zine section. Like one of the students that worked in the library got really into it. The head librarian doesn't specifically you know, keep it up, but it's there for the public to come see. They're like this many, but it's still there. But have you ever thought of kind of attaching yourself to another library, or do you think negatively of that, or much? I totally think about that all the time because <laughs> um, I volunteer at the library in Olympia, and I'm the only volunteer who's not there doing community service for smoking pot. And it's there for <laughs> <about> the <library. laughs> and, um, Like that's that's kind of really like. Um, Unlike a lot of professions that people can get into, I really see librarians, um, they have a great history of um, like working on free speech issues and literacy advocacy. Um, like one of the big things if you go to school to work in circulation is about like um, secrecy and like not revealing to like the authorities what books people checked out, um, you know, working on anti-censorship things. Um, so I would like to, um, I would like to see um, zines become a part of a regular library, and that's in a way like that's kind of an idea I have for um, like putting them on CD-ROM is to make them available to other libraries. Um, yeah, because I just libraries are really a non-commercial institution that I don't have any problems with, um, and I did write a um, Evergreen State College has. Um, like a $2,000 grant that they give to the library to spend on whatever project the student nominates. And I did nominate putting zines in the Evergreen Library um, as part of that thing this year. And I won't find out until Super Saturday whether or not we got the money. But if Evergreen did, they would get $2,000 just for um, like acquiring zines and putting them into the library system there. So, which would be separate from the zine library, but it would be a start to them getting to do something. Have you traveled around and visited some of the other free libraries? Um, I've only seen the one at the Epicenter Zone in, um, in San Francisco. I think it was that University of Minnesota also has one in the library system, but I haven't gotten to travel to see any of those ones yet. I think there's also one at Bard College um, yes. in New York, but I haven't been there yet. I haven't seen it, but I've read uh, a pretty extensive collection. I don't know how recently they've been acquiring new titles, but at the University of Missoula at Montana, of all places, has a pretty extensive collection. I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to see the other, <coughs> the other ones. I, there's another university I've heard of in the United States that has like 1970s British punk fans. Um, and I'm trying to network more of those people to find out what's going on. Jen? I'm sorry, I'm going back. Um, the College of Zine World compiled a huge list of zine libraries. There's like millions of them out there. Not millions, but there's like 35 zine libraries that exist around the world, which is way more than I ever thought would exist. And I have a kind of outdated list 
with me. I don't have copies to take, but I could email them to anybody who wants them or whatever. We could. I give you Doug's email address, like anybody who is interested. But there's like tons of them out there. So if anybody wants a current list, you can come to me and I'll tell you where to find it. Yeah, I did try sending postcards to the same libraries, and like she said, our list might be outdated. Um, like a lot of them just got sent back, like PO box closed. So I really don't know what's going on with a lot of them. But I do think like. I'd like to do more networking. I think that there needs to be more networking going on between the same libraries because we're all working on similar projects. Are there any zines you would feel head to the next step thing? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I definitely have. There's this one G.G. Allen fanzine in particular <laughs> that, like, I, I, I look at it and I'm just like, they're doing these awful things with Simpsons characters. <laughs> and what? like, I, you know, I don't want to, but at the same time that, um, that goes into just how I feel about free speech, that I really feel that people have the ability to read things and judge for themselves. And the fact is, is that like, for every like, 100 Riot Girl zines and every 200 music fan zines we have and every 300 poetry zines, you know, there's like two totally fucked up, racist, sexist, homophobic, like things that like I think are, that I personally think are a waste of paper. But having it in the zine library, you know, people can look at it and say like, well, this is such a minority of the thought that's going on. And I think that it's still important to say that and say like, this is, you know, attitudes that people had, you know, in the 1990s in America you know, and just be real upfront about it and not say that this is the norm. I'm not saying anything about it. It's just there and, you know, people can draw their own conclusions as to why somebody, you know, would make that. Um, I know Epicenter, the first time I went there, had a sign that said that they didn't accept racist, sexist, homophobic, religious material. But I just found that there were so many zines where, like, I would read something and be like, you know, oh, that's fucked up and homophobic. But you know, who am I to judge and maybe other people wouldn't see it that way, you know, or at least people can talk about it if you read it. But like, if you don't like read Rush Limbaugh, how are you gonna be able to say he's bad? Like, you don't even know what he's talking about, you know? So I just think it's really important to like educate yourself on things that you don't believe in because that just makes your, your opinion and your argument all the much stronger when you actually know what you're talking about instead of just saying, oh, I don't like this idea. So yeah, there's, there's a couple of scenes that I don't like that are in there, but you know, they're there for people to look at. You know, they can make their decisions. If somebody took it and burned it, you know, I probably wouldn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
another really good thing, if you like want to start a seed library and are looking for cheap office equipment, is um, they have school auctions that you can find in the newspaper. And basically what they are is they're selling off all of the old like elementary school things that they don't need anymore. Um, like I got a full working mimeograph machine, like with the purple ink from elementary school <laughs> for five dollars. So I have my own photocopier even though I never use it. But um, like there's a lot of ways to like try to find like um, like card catalogs or businesses that are getting rid of filing systems, um, you know, and not spend a whole lot of money on like getting things to put scenes in. Yeah, yeah, like the end. and you want to look up articles on like tropical fish and you just type in tropical fish and it tells you like what magazine articles to go look for. Um, that would be really good and it would definitely be a um, like a prime time to do it as we scan them on to CD. Um, another thing I've been looking into though is um, like getting grant money um, from libraries and it looks like um, it looks like if I go to grad school or find somebody who has a degree in library sciences, that there would be um, money available to really like help so that like somebody could do that like practically as a full-time job. Um, living in Olymp the cost of living in Olympia is really, really super cheap, um, which is what makes it totally possible for me to like work part-time and go to school and do the zine library. Um, yeah, so I could totally like I'd totally love to have that be like part of the, the computer program. Um, the biggest thing, and like one of the questions I have for you guys to consider is that I'm putting these zines into the library without the permission of the people who wrote the zines in a lot of cases. And that's my next big question when I um, start putting things onto CD is um, like, should I just do the zines where I wrote to these people and they said it was okay? Or should you know, or should I just do it for every zine to make them totally accessible? Um, and I'm going to really have to go into a lot of copyright law in school to figure out, like, even if it would be possible to do it without people's um, permission for academic and research purposes, where copyright law gets a little more vague um, to let you do things like this. take notice of it and make a big deal out of it, 
you'll realize that it's going to follow you for years and years and years and years and years. And um, I just found like kids in the punk scene can just be really vicious about something you wrote five years ago. Um, and I almost feel like I'm entering into dangerous territory because of that in archiving scenes. Um, like I've had people say like, oh, there's scenes of mine that I don't want in the scene library. You know, it's kind of like, well, I'm doing this as an archive, but at the same time, I want to respect, you know, people's right to like, you know, not. But I mean, that's the thing is like, like they say, like you know, you gave your word, like when you write, you know, or get it in writing. Well, you have it in writing now. What are you going to do about it? And another thing my friend said was like, he wouldn't want, um, you know, his zine to ever become part of his like police record, and that's like a very feasible and dangerous thing that could happen with an archive like this is that, you know, here's a permanent record if you're ever in trouble with the FBI, you know, type in your name and they'll have everything you said when you were in junior high school about being <laughs> the government. Um, you know, and I, I, I want to keep scenes available for people, but, you know, I don't want, I don't want to see anybody getting in trouble because of something they said when they were 15. I think you point about, about the last thing about
you know, to draw a picture. And all for something that if the police had just left it alone, nobody would have done this. Yeah, all for a, a comic book. It's closing in on 2 o'clock, and we're going to do another workshop then. So uh, if there's any more questions, like maybe we can take a couple more, and then we're going to break up. How did, how's it organized? Is it by, by like, office, or is it by like, editor's last name? Um, we just organize it by the, um, by the title of the theme um, to hopefully help with people who like read the zines and put them back on the shelves and not have to like go through them and find out like, the author. Um, and I just don't really how people remember scenes or know about scenes. Um, when we tried to do the card catalog, it was really awesome because you could say like, oh, I want to read Nomi Lamb scenes and then read like, you know, I think Nomi Lamb and Joshua Clay just won the award for most scenes in the zine library. They each had about 12 in there. And, um, you know, you could go and say like, oh, we have this many scenes that this person did and go look them up by title. Um, but right now, it's, it's more like you have to know the title of the zine and, and then go to that section and find it. Yeah, my... Yeah, that's pretty much all the questions that I had to raise for you guys. And if you have any other questions, just come see me. I'm going to be here today and tomorrow and at the film tonight um, in my zines. For sale or trade over there, um, that table that Rita's probably going to be behind. And I also have a pink project listing things I'm working on, and a blue flyer that's information about the Olympia Zine Library and how to contact us to send us um, zines and how you can help out. Rita? Yeah.